Good afternoon, everyone. So thank you for the introduction. And in return, I also want to uh, thank some of the people that I've ha I have had the pleasure to work with to make this summit such a success. I'd like to mention our partners at the Vermont Law School, uh, especially Rebecca Valentine, uh, with whom it has been a pleasure to work with and with the hopes that we'll strengthen this relationship in the future. Um, I also want to thank especially Doug Lantain and Allison Neihardt from the UVM Food Systems Initiative, who have really been behind this, as well as the reviewers that volunteered their valuable time to help us select our panelists. And now it is with great pleasure that I want to introduce Dr. Raj Patel. He is currently a research professor in the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. Also, he currently serves as a senior research associate at the Unit for the Humanities at Rhodes University in South Africa. Raj's accomplishments are many, so I have been forced to be somewhat selective in this introduction. He has been a visiting scholar at the UC Berkeley Center for African Studies, an honorary research fellow at the School of Development Studies at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and he is also a longtime research fellow of the Institute for Food and Development Studies, or Food First. Between 2011 and 2013, Raj was a food and community fellow at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. As an award-winning writer, activist, and academic, Raj has contributed to research and dialogue on sustainable food systems in a wide diversity of ways. For example, last year, he co-taught the edible education class at UC Berkeley with Michael Pollan. He has also testified about the causes of the global food crisis to the US House Financial Services Committee and acted as an advisor to Olivia de Schutter, the former United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. He has also both worked, I really like this one, for and protested against the World Bank and the World Trade Organization. Raj has published widely in a diversity of media, ranging from academic journals and books to the news media. Yeah, these last include The Guardian, The New York Times, The LA Times, among others. Many of you are probably familiar with his book, Stuffed and Starved, which presents a critical analysis of one of the biggest contradictions in our current food, food system, that millions of people in the world currently are suffering pervasive hunger on the one hand, and on the other hand, millions of people are suffering an obesity crisis. So this book does a really good analysis of the reasons behind this. His latest book, The Value of Nothing, focuses on global economics and the contradictions of how society deals with prices and value. It has been a New York Times bestseller. In addition, I have really appreciated Raj's writings um, on the conceptualizations and applications of food sovereignty. Um, there's, there's some recent articles in the Journal of Peasant Studies that I highly recommend. Raj obtained his BA from Oxford University and MS from the London School of Economics and a PhD from Cornell University's Department of Development Sociology. To conclude, I'd like to add uh, on a personal level that I have followed Raj's work for many years. Something that I have really come to value is his critical yet constructive perspective on some of the most pressing agri-food system issues that we face today. In addition, I really appreciate that he can bring to his work a very good sense of humor and a very strong sense of hope. With this, please help me welcome Raj Patel to the podium. Thank you, Alison, um, and Doug, and Rebecca, and Ernesto for that lovely introduction. Also, thank you, uh, the University of Vermont and the Vermont Law School for making it possible for me to learn so much uh, from, from the panelists uh, and from the, the keynote speakers. It's, it's, been, it's been super exciting, so I'm gonna ch change things up and tell you stuff you already know now. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I, because what I'd like to do uh, is 
talk about some of the words that were on the slide before this one. You know, the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm an out linguist. Uh, and I, I think that words like food system uh, deserve a bit of unpacking. So that's what I'm going to do as soon as I find somewhere to put this bottle. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, what I want to do in this talk is three things. One, I want, to, I want to find out what's sort of systemic about the food system. I want to just give an overview of what that is so that we understand, two, what it is that we are being urged to think are the solutions uh, to the problems of hunger and malnutrition in the world today. And then three, I, I want to think about what are the different politics that we might resort to, politics that emerge from agroecology uh, that can actually get us to the right to food. Uh, and those politics are, I, I would like to submit, revolutionary. I want to put the R back in uh, revolutionary. Um, so, uh, well, the R's already there. Uh, but but I, 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 I want us to just engage with that R, to, to think of evolution. I mean, if we want our food system to evolve, we do need to think revolutionary thoughts, and that should be OK. Uh, so with that in mind, let's, let's think about what the food system is. Um, to do that, uh, we have to go, unfortunately, back in time to England uh, in the... Um, uh, in the 1450s. Now, uh, England in the 1450s uh, is, is not a pleasant place. Uh, uh, you know, curry hasn't arrived there. P people are eating very bad food. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, uh, uh, in particular, it's characterized by feudalism. Uh, this is a map, a very grainy map, of a, a Yorkshire village called Billingsley. Uh, and it's a fairly recent map, but you can see, nonetheless, sort of traces of uh, the history of that landscape. You can see the fences. Now, in the 1450s, uh, a, a, a greedy king, King Henry VII, uh, imposed taxes on the landlords. Uh, and the landlords had this feudal economy underneath them where peasants had a little bit of land and then uh, common land on which they practiced the arts of, of commoning. So, you know, you, you, Baron Blue would have a, a little bit and uh, Lord, you know, Lord Puce over there would, would have something and, uh, you know, Baron uh, Von well, it would probably be Vaughan, but just regular baron, you know, sort of uh, magenta there would have something. But then there would be these yellow, uh, the, the, these spaces for, for commoning, you know, areas that are sort of dotted around where people had together uh, to figure out how it was that they were going to manage that land. And uh, th there are terms that have their sort of remnants in the English language, terms like uh, gleaning, for example. Everyone knows what gleaning is, right? Where, where you take crops that are overhanging in, in the public domain and you share them and you, you, you can take them, they're fair game. Uh, stinting is, is another term. You know, when you hear someone who, who, whose labors are unstinting, we, we have that, that sort of remnant. Uh, the idea of stinting is that you don't consume this year uh, in, because you know that you will need it for next year. Uh, so you don't let something enter an economy. You don't let it be fair game for everyone. Everyone agrees that we, we save these forests because we'll need them. Right? So, so those arts uh, are, are, are developed and they're there, and all of a sudden, uh, with the arrival of this debt, landlords have to figure out how to, how to pay the bills. And what they do is enclose the commons. And that has a number of, uh, of consequences. First of all, obviously, it kicks out the peasants. Uh, it means that peasants aren't able to survive, uh, and they have few choices, either to sell their labor to, uh, to the landlord or to move to cities um, where they, they sell their labor for, for whatever price they can get. For some, that doesn't, you know, that, that, that works out okay. Um, but it, it means that these, these conditions, I mean, if you are lucky enough to be that landlord, then what, what you have is the possibility of uh, expanding your land holdings. And all of a sudden, you have large patches of land on which modern agriculture, as we understand it, can flourish. You know, the agriculture of uh, combine harvesters and genetically modified crops doesn't work on bits of land like this. It emerges through bits of land that are much larger, where uh, you've, uh, you, you've kicked off labor and you're able to accumulate capital, and then capital is what you substitute for labor, and all of a sudden, you've got this new in magical industrial and agricultural system. But for all of that to happen, you need the fences, you need the debt, you need the power of enclosure, you need to privatize land and dispossess people. So that's, you know, that said, um, for some people, it's, it works out all right, um, and for these people in particular. Uh, I, I love this picture. It's a, it's a Gainsborough, uh, it's, a, it's a 1750 portrait of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, uh, Robert and Francis Andrews, and there they are on their estate in uh, Sudbury in England. 
Um, and what's super, I mean, th th this painting has a number of really interesting, interesting things about it if you're an art historian. Uh, first of all, it is actually the landscape that they had. Uh, and uh, that, that, that was unusual, rather than just imagining a landscape, he was, uh, Gainsborough was commissioned to paint this landscape. Um, and but first of all, of course, uh, you, you may notice the, the enclosures there. You have uh, fences uh, in, in which uh, th there are sheep, uh, and you, you'll see you know, different kinds of, fa of farming happening. Uh, you'll, you'll see these nice, nice neat rows of wheat. Um, they, they are uh, a sign, actually, the, the, the neatness of those rows are a sign that this was a, a modern agricultural facility. Uh, Robert Andrews was a published agronomist. He, he had two or three articles in agricultural journals at the time. Um, and he was using, uh, you know, bleeding edge technology uh, for, for his time. But these were put there by, by something called a seed drill, uh, invented by Jethro Tull, um, who some of you ought to know better than clearly you do. Uh, it's sort of British prog rock, it's very exciting. Um, but but uh, so Jethro Tull, inventor of the, the seed drill, um, and, and What's interesting here, you know, nice neat lines, and you've got the, uh, the sort of vision of these stacks of wheat nicely bundled up. But of course, what's missing from this picture is labor. You don't see any of the workers. They've been banished from the imagination. Um, and of course, we're talking about how even today, when we think about sustainable food systems, often labor is dropped out of that vision, right? Um, but also, uh, you, you, you have the, this nice neat technology in these nice owned spaces. But look at these guys. So first of all, uh, Robert Andrews. Um, I mean, I'm not an art historian, but I can tell that that guy's pretty relaxed. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, he, he is wearing basically the, the sort of, you know, uh, you know, a 17, you know, 1750s leisure suit. Uh, you know, it's the equivalent of wearing a T-shirt that, say, that says, I'm with stupid. Uh, I mean, this is as, as relaxed as it's possible to be in public uh, in, in the 1750s. He's, he's, he's clearly down with, I mean, he's, he's, he's happy, he's kind of groovy and floppy. Um, but, but, but what's interesting is right next to him is his wife. Mrs. Andrews, uh, you, you'll see that she is considerably less relaxed, uh, and uh, she, you know, she, she's uh, up, bolt upright. There's an area of the painting that's unfinished here, uh, and some people speculate that that's, that's where a bird would have gone that, that uh, Mr. Andrews was about to shoot. Um, it, it may be where some needlework was going to happen, or it would be placed there, or possibly a little baby Andrews um, at, at some point in the future would be painted there, but it's, it's been left blank. But what people have noticed is that this is a painting about ownership. This is a painting about private property. Not only does Mr. Andrews own the landscape, but uh, many people have noticed he, he also owns his wife. And that's an interesting uh, observation about the transformations of modern capitalism, that with enclosure uh, and with the advent of capitalism comes really profound relationship uh, transformations in the, the, the work of women um, uh, and uh, in what women are, are allowed to do. They're no lo longer allowed to be part of uh, producers of agricultural knowledge. They are not allowed to be healers. They're not allowed to be educators. They are confined to the kitchen and the bedroom. Uh, and those are the tasks um, that, that, uh, that, that clearly are represented here in terms of ownership and domination. Now, I, I, we'll come back to quite how important that is uh, in, in terms of the history of agriculture, um, but it, just hold, hold that in mind, that her work is the work of care uh, in, this, uh, you know, in, in, in this new brave vision of, of agriculture, and she's not allowed to do anything else. Now, in order to feed the workers who we don't see there, uh, England and Britain needed to expand, and it wasn't just Britain, of course, uh, the, you know, the, the, there's, there's a sort of huge colonial history um, oh, let's go back to that. Uh, and uh, you, you, I mean, you, you see these sort of vectors of European domination uh, and Ottoman domination as well around the world. Uh, I mean, of, of course, you know, that, that extends to the United States. Uh, here we are on Abenaki land, land that was once uh, peopled by First Nations who have been exterminated uh, so that we can now forget about them and have our discussions about sustainable agriculture. But I mean, that, that's, the, that, that's the bloody history of the land on which we stand. Uh, that, uh, that in, in order to be able to bring cheap food back to the, metropoli uh, the metropolises of, of, of Europe for workers who were being paid very little, uh, other parts of the world were subjugated. That's, that's part of the global, I mean, of the ecology of, of the, the food system. That's why certain crops look, you know, what, what's sometimes called the Colombian exchange. There was nothing exchangey about it. Um, it was, you know, the, the moment of colonial contact 
uh, in, involved, you know, the, the transportation of different crops around the world with profound ecological consequences. Um, and that has brought about this era of cheap food. I mean, the, 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 in order for workers to have that cheap food, you needed the colonial domination. But the cheap food is important. And more and more places are following that lead. Uh, and th there was a very interesting report that came out earlier on this year um, uh, about uh, the, 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 the domination of cheap food and the increasing cheapness of cheap food. Uh, I, I don't know if, you, if, if this is... Uh, if, you, if, you, if you can read this at the back. But basically, uh, what, what this is showing, and, and this, these are recent changes. I mean, we, we could track this back historically for, you know, for, for, for centuries, if you like. Uh, but what this suggests is that when you're looking at the prices of food today, uh, you, I mean, you, you can see the ones that have gone up the most uh, are uh, you know, the, the fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, and of course, these are in different, you know, a, a range of different countries. Um, this is not just in the United States. In fact, the, the countries represented there for fresh fruits and vegetables are Br Brazil, Korea, and Mexico. Um, and you, you can see that, you know, correspondingly, processed foods have declined in price. This is a sort of outlier for chicken in Mexico. Um, and dried rice in Korea. But basically, uh, the, the, the processed food cluster has, has been going up far less and in, in some cases has become much cheaper over time. Whereas if you're trying to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, if you're trying to eat sustainably, if you're trying to eat the kinds of things that ought to be uh, much, much more affordable, uh, you're going to have a hard time because our food system is tilted against that kind of sustainability. It's geared towards providing cheap food for cheap workers. Um, and in order for that to happen, we need cheap nature. We need not to pay the full environmental costs of the work that we're doing. Uh, I mean, that, that's again a sort of one of the, the consequences of when you enclose the land, then the stuff inside your enclosure you may care about, but you don't have to worry about the, the environmental externalities. And of course, we're all guilty of participating in that kind of exploitation of nature. Later on this year, for instance, we will have the, uh, the climate change talks in Paris. Uh, and uh, reliably, I mean, already you can see in the newspaper um, talk about, well, China is just, you know, they're, they're bastards over there. They'd set fire to anything if they could. You know, the air pollution is horrible. Um, and uh, whereas, you know, we, I mean, in, in Europe, uh, you, you, Europe is doing just fine, and the United States, well, we don't really manufacture anything anymore, so we, you know, we're, we're, we're not really part of the problem. But what's interesting is I, I found th this incredibly interesting. Um, this is a, uh, a, a consumption-based accounting of carbon dioxide uh, emissions. And, and what it suggests is that uh, the reason that China's emissions are so high is because we have outsourced our pollution to China. We have cheapened nature in China so that we can uh, have the various electronics that we're you know, pointing at the screen now uh, to, uh, to, to be able to, to tweet on and, uh, and, and not worry terribly much about the... Yeah, and, and then blame China for the, for the carbon emissions. Uh, you know, the laser point... You know, th th there, is, there is no one in this room who is not guilty of that. But I, I just want to point that out, that we participate in this ecology, uh, and often it's hidden from us, and often uh, you know, its forces, its, syst you know, its systemic forces are obscure. And it's important to be clear about them so that we understand quite how much has to change, so that we're not afraid of the idea of the need for something revolutionary. We can't evolve our way out of this. And in fact, if we're, if we're, if we're relying on the private sector to do things for us, I, I want to point out something tragic. This uh, graph comes from, some, uh, from uh, a group of bomb-throwing anarchists uh, at uh, KPMG. Um, uh, it's, it, it, you know, the, 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 the accountancy firm, KPMG. It's a really interesting graph. Uh, well, what it shows is the profits of different industries and the proportion of those uh, profits that are environmental damage. And I, I, I learned about this from the head of sustainability at Nestle. Uh, he, he was saying uh, that at Nestle, they'd done their own uh, internal accounting, and they, they'd found that, that basically the, you know, the, the story in this graph is right. Uh, and the, the bit that I want to, to point out, well, first of all, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, we've got oil and gas over here. Uh, the oil industry uh, has profits of, what is that, $670 billion. Uh, and 23% of those in a very conservative accounting uh, in the environmental damages of the oil industry. So even if the oil industry you know, had a sort of epiphany and decided, yes, we are going to pay for our environmental harm, they'd still be way in the clear. They'd, make, they'd, make, they'd still make a ton of cash. Um, but uh, what's particularly interesting to me is uh, the food industry. The food industry makes $89 billion uh, of profit, but its environmental costs are 224% of those profits. And so when you hear from someone at Nestle saying, yeah, this is kind of the story we found in our own internal accounting, and, and you know, the reason we don't share it is because if we shared it, the, the financial markets would kill us. Uh, that's super interesting, because I mean, Nestle's profits last year was $15 billion. 
Uh, but the, you know, what we were hearing from the guy at, at Nestle was that the, the environmental damage was closer to the revenue of the company, and the revenue of the company is $100 billion. So if you're asking the food industry to make small tweaks and be nicer to the farmers and you know, have slightly fairer trade, that's great. But reckon with this. Reckon with that, that kind of a number and show me the, you know, the, the industrial agriculture model that's able to internalize those costs. You can't do it. So we do need to be thinking systemically differently, which is, of course, what our leaders uh, are not allowing us to do. Uh, in, instead, uh, we find ourselves in, this, in a world where, and, and I think that this, you know, if, if, if there's a, a, a set of ideas that sort of sum up the food system and its role in, in uh, the, the wider world, I, I just want to share this. Um, th these are ideas that I'm developing with uh, my colleague Jason Moore, um, and he has fantastic ideas around world ecology, and we're, we're kind of put, putting them together at the moment. But the idea is that in order for, for there to be uh, workers in the cities who have been displaced from rural areas, they need cheap care, right? You, you, you need uh, you, communities to be taken care of. You need uh, you know, uh, uh, food to be cooked, elders to be taken care of, children to be raised. But in order to do that, you need cheap food. You know, the, 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 the dollar burger we can all castigate and the meatification of our diets, the increased meat consumption we're encouraged to participate in, is all very bad. But sometimes uh, that cheap meat, that processed food is a lifeline if you're uh, on, on a, a low income and, you know, a dollar, burger, a dollar will buy you one of those. Um, and so that, that, but that cheap food in turn needs cheap fuel. And uh, Anastasia was talking about, um, you know, the subsidies that we already give the, the, uh, the, the industries uh, that, that produce our food. But even market price fuel is cheap fuel. And on top of that, you know, the, and the reason it's cheap is because the nature, the, the, the place where we outsource the emissions, the, the, the place that, the, you know, the, the, the ecology in which those emissions flow is cheapened as well. So you see the links, right? Am I, am I, am I, is this kind of making sense? That, that there's a huge chain of connections that are not just about the food and the environment, but work, nature, uh, and the, the, the you know, a, a fuel in particular as a, as a specific input, uh, and, uh, and care as well, uh, and the work of reproductive labor. So uh, how do we address that? We address that by um, protesting. Uh, I mean, that's been one of the interesting things that's, you know, the, the fight for 15, uh, the, you know, the, the, that's, that's been a really important uh, push that Smith was talking about yesterday is a, a demand to, to first of all to undo some of that by saying workers don't you know, workers shouldn't be cheap. I mean, fifteen dollars an hour is still cheap, um, but it, it's it's about a transformation in the way that we think about uh, work and agriculture. Uh, so certainly, the fight for fifteen is is about fast food, but it's also about migration. Um, it's also about a recognition of the the, the, the patterns of trade and domination that that, that, that uh, the food industry depends on in the United States and that farming depends on in the United States, particularly in California. But it's also about a, f a fight for 15 for care work. And I think this is tremendously important, right? That the fight for 15 isn't just about the shitty jobs in the food system, but it's about the things that enable those shitty jobs. Uh, and care work is one of them. And I think that, that again, stitching those together is tremendously important for us to understand how it is that we resist this global ecology, and then what it is that we might do about that afterwards. Um, unfortunately, uh, there are men like this. Uh, this is the British Prime Minister, uh, uh, David Cameron. Um, and in, you know, in the face of you know, the, the, this global ecology of cheapness, um, he and his friends at the Group of Eight uh, have a different vision. Uh, they, th their vision for combating food insecurity uh, is something called the New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition. Uh, and, and it was launched under the Obama presidency by then head of USAID, Raj Shah. Um, and what, what he was saying is, uh, you know, essentially, that there was no way that we could make all the things happen that agriculture in the global south needed. We need, we need uh, research, we need agricultural stores, we need extension services, and there's no way of doing that without the private sector, he said. Um, which is, of course, rubbish. Uh, if you look at the history of uh, agriculture, if you look at the Green Revolution, for example, uh, from you know, 1945, uh, actually things like stores and grain, uh, you know, uh, grain in, uh, research, uh, it, it, you know, the, the research in hybrid varieties, all of that was funded not by the private sector, but by uh, philanthropists, by foundations, by the Rockefeller Foundation. And, you know, the Gates Foundation was at this meeting. Um, but 
what was interesting about this meeting was uh, that th this was held in uh, 2013, I think, in, in, in London. Uh, and you can see here that uh, the private sector does have its solutions for us, and uh, th th those involve partnership with the government. Uh, and uh, you know, David Cameron was very excited uh, to, to present the idea of nutrition for growth, beating hunger through business and science. Um, and uh, before he came up, uh, there, was a, th th there was a presentation by um, uh, two uh, young people, one from Kenya, I think, well, Kenya and one from Tanzania, uh, Frank and Wajuma were their names. We never learned their second names, but Frank and Wajuma came up uh, and they, you know, they said, look, we, we, are, we have survived malnutrition. Uh, we have survived the kinds of, of situation where our parents had to go out to work and we were staying with our grandparents and they didn't have enough food. We have made it through our, uh, you know, uh, our spell with malnutrition, but no one else should have to go through that. We need, we need change. And then you know, David Cameron comes up and says, well, yeah, Frank and Majuma, you know, it's a very sad story that they had, but it's not just a sad story, it's bad economics, he said. Uh, and he, he then went on to recount the, the, the costs of, uh, of malnutrition. It's billions of dollars a year, he said, in lost productivity. Uh, and and, and I, I just want to take a step back there and observe, I mean, how many of you remember a time when it would have been kind of awkward to say that? Right? I mean, when I was growing up, to, to, I mean, in the 1970s and 80s, to say, here are some hungry Africans, they are just an economic catastrophe. You know, their hunger is... Uh, is costing them and their economies millions and millions of dollars, and if only we invested in them, the returns would be fantastic. That would have been a sick thing to say. Uh, and now it is normal. It is part of the sort of business businessification of uh, understanding hunger. Uh, the, a certain sort of economism when it comes to hunger that we all, at some, you know, at some level, we use it because it's like the best way of showing that we can provide return on investment, and it's fucked up. There's nothing okay about that because the minute you allow that kind of calculation to come in, you've thrown out the right to food. Right? The right to food is a right. There shouldn't be any if, buts, or ands, or, you know, and it'll only cost us this much. That's a secondary concern. The main thing is it's a right. And what this model, this new alliance for food security and nutrition does, is premise itself not on anything like a right, but on an investment, uh, on something that, that, that provides a return. And it's a very slippery and dangerous slope. But Okay, well, let's, let's roll with it for a little bit um, and, and see what it is uh, that, that, that can be done. And, of course, when, when business hears the term investment, uh, it was, it's like a dog whistle. Uh, and the, the, these, the, this, this, all of a sudden, um, yeah, and, and you, you know, this language about investment and return and, you know, for, for the starving kids, that language emerges really in, in the early 1990s when the World Bank, you know, with the fall of the Soviet Union, when all of a sudden rights talk is kind of set back and you have this moment of triumphalism and capitalism was the best after all. Uh, and in that moment, uh, the World Bank takes it upon itself to start doing research in, uh, I into investing in healthcare, uh, sorry, investing in, in nutrition. Uh, and th th there comes uh, this thing called the Business Alliance for Food and Fortification, uh, you know, headed by your, your, your favorite uh, carers for the sick and hungry. Um, and uh, th th these organizations heard the idea of investment and they said, you know, we can help because companies already own the right technology to make a difference, as well as the distribution channels and communication networks. Uh, and, th I mean, the, the, I, you know, the, 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 that's, it, that, that's, that's obviously a problem, um, because actually a better characterization of this, uh, you know, this new alliance, so some people have said, in fact, Eric Holt Jimenez said it, uh, is that this isn't about fortification necessarily. This isn't really about uh, companies doing the right thing and maybe Nestle and Coke adding a few more vitamins to their, uh, you know, to their products and Nestle selling fortified biscuits or Coke selling Diet Coke Plus. Do, do, do people remember Diet Coke Plus? You, the, the, okay, it, it didn't last long, uh, partly because it was so bad. Uh, so uh, Diet Coke Plus is uh, regular Diet Coke with added vitamins and minerals. So um, uh, it, you, can, you can have zero calories and uh, still drink something that tastes like a chemistry set uh, and, uh, and, you know, flourish as a result. And, uh, you know, the... the, the, the uh, so so that, that, that didn't last long, but, but I mean, it, it's the logical place to go 
when you have business coming in saying, no, we can help. We, you, know, you want less calories, we can do that. You want more nutrition, we can do that. Diet Coke Plus, it's the answer, right? I mean, we ask business those questions, that's the answer they give. Uh, but the other thing about this new alliance is that it's, uh, it's about a certain kind of recolonization. Um, and uh, you know, when people heard about the new alliance and heard some of the rules around it, around you know, making investments easier and that, that, that sort of thing, people said, no, this is, you know, this is just another attempt for business to take over parts of the world where they, they've, you know, they, they want to deepen their impact. Um, and it's very interesting because that causes split in civil society. And so uh, the, the, one of the organizations uh, that defended the new alliance, I mean, that there, there are a few, I think, uh, that Save the Children is part of the, uh, you know, is one of the partners of the alliance. Uh, another one that, that was really out there is the organization One. Uh, you may have heard it uh, promoted by Bono and occasionally Jeffrey Sachs, I believe. Um, but One said, look, um, yes, it's true that if you look at the agricultural, if you look at the investments that come from this new alliance, um, it doesn't look great uh, in terms of uh, you know, the, the, the countries that are doing it. Uh, you, you see Norway there um, is the largest investor. Uh, do you know why? Take a guess. Norway. Oil and gas, that's close enough. Yeah, Yara, the world's largest fertilizer company, um, is... Uh, uh, was investing, uh, at this point, to uh, the tune of $1.5 billion, but, but apparently they've doubled that now. Um, so th th there are a, a, a very large amount of this is about businesses you know, d uh, moving forward. Syngenta's, uh, 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 yeah, I mean, the, 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 the Swiss agricultural giants have kind of weighed in as well. Um, but one said, no, 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 yeah, it's, it's true about all those green ones, but, but look over here, look, there's plucky little Tanzania um, who, who, who are also investing in this new alliance. Um, though it turns out that the Tanzanian investment was, uh, front, was basically a front company for a biofuels company headquartered in Europe. Um, so it does kind of look like the new alliance for food security and nutrition has nothing to do with food security and nutrition. It's actually about something else. Um, it's about you know, recolonization. It's about you know, deepening businesses' hold on uh, the environment and actually uh, hold on the food system and negating this idea of the right to food. Um, but, you know, and, and if we look at the specific things that countries are asked to do, like Malawi, for instance, Malawi had some, and it, it, it signed up when uh, uh, David Cameron was there, and uh, you know, the, the, uh, Joyce Banda, the pres then president of Malawi, um, signed a commitment to join this new alliance at, uh, at this particular summit. And uh, so she, uh, you know, she, she submitted her country to, to, to the, the, the main things that this new alliance was about. And here are the three commitments of the, uh, the new alliance for food security and nutrition. Uh, commitment one, an improved score on doing business index, uh, moving up to the top 100 companies. The second thing is an increased dollar value of private sector investment in the agriculture sector and value added agro processing. And the number three thing is increased private investment in commercial production, sale of inputs and produce and value addition. So you, you, you might say, well, so Where's, where's the food? Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, you, 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 I mean, you've talked a lot about agriculture, but, but actually, where's, where's the nutrition? Where's the food? Um, and part of this is that actually that there, there is a nutrition component. I mean, obviously, th th these are bad enough. I mean, I, I should point out this ease of doing business index is really very pernicious. It's a powerful way to govern a country without imposing things on it. But, but by merely asking countries, like India, for instance, uh, w has gamed uh, and uh, you know, transformed itself to be able to reduce environmental uh, you know, regulation and reduce labor protections in order to increase its score. Because to do business easily is to have none of this fettering of uh, your business by environmental or labor concerns. So to do business easier means to actually ask a country to, to push down its environmental and, uh, and labor concerns. But you don't actually say that. All you say is, we just want you to raise your, just do a little better on the, you know, make it easier, just a little bit easier. We know, we know we're not saying anything. But, but the, the ease of doing business index is like a god in the sky that people look up at and like, oh shit, I better do that. Uh, and uh, you, we have lots of examples of countries uh, that, that are trying to, to that, that have uh, increased their ease of doing business by precisely cutting these kinds of corners around labor and the environment. Um, so again, I mean, that, that, that brings us to, to this question, right? Well, so, so where's, you know, where's the food security? Where's the nutrition? Partly, it's, uh, the, this is a picture of salt. 
Uh, w w one of the, the suggestions, it, it, this isn't mandatory, but one of the suggestions for Malawi was, what you need to do is iodize salt. Uh, people in Malawi are miss missing iodine in their diets, and you know, one, of the, one of the ways to, to transform the food system is to fortify salt. And again, you know, th there's nothing wrong with adding iodine to salt. It's actually a tremendously useful way of combating a range of diseases. The trouble is that you need to be able to, be able to buy salt in order to, to be able to, to have it in your body. And uh, if you're not tackling poverty, then, then, then you're in trouble. There was another suggestion that was about nutrition, um, and it was, uh, it was about this. It's hard to find a, 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 a picture of maternity leave. Um, so uh, this is as close as I'm able to get. This is a picture of maternity leave. Um, uh, the, uh, Malawi, the, the Malawi government were, was encouraged to increase maternity leave uh, from eight to 12 weeks, I believe it was, or to, to, for, from eight weeks to some unspecified larger number. Um, but th that's the, I mean, and that again is important in terms of nutrition and it's important in terms of uh, making sure that there's, you know, that, that, that there's a sort of stable foundation in the first thousand days of life and what have you. Uh, but it's not something the Malawi government has, has committed itself to. So what we end up with is Frank and Majuma at this conference. This is Frank and Majuma. Um, and we have them showing, you know, being paraded essentially in, in front of uh, the world's leaders. And you show their bodies, and then experts will come in and tell them what it is that they're going to do. Business and science will take care of Frank and Majuma. So the role of Frank and Majuma, the role of people who are surviving and fighting malnutrition, is essentially as bodies, right? This is the food industry's habeas corpus. You show the body but you don't really care what they think. They're not, I mean, it's, it's, you, you show their bodies, and then you get them off stage so that uh, David Cameron can say, poor investments and good investments, and, you know, and, and fortification, and yes, we need you know, vitamin B12 in our biscuits, uh, but uh, nothing that Frank and Majuma say makes any difference. Um, and that's because what this New Deal, this, this idea of fortification, of nutritionism, and uh, I, I really, uh, you know, the, the work of Georgi Skrinis, uh, the uh, Australian academic, is really very interesting here. Uh, and Aya Kimura at the University of Hawaii, really fantastic work they've, they've done on uncovering this idea of nutritionism. Um, that's the world that we're entering in. Uh, it, it's a world of, uh, an era of poverty with added vitamins, right? You're not really caring about the poverty part now. You're not really caring about the right to food so much as the, you know, the adequate nutrition. That's the bit that's, uh, when you're talking about investment, that makes sense to the private sector. So in, in, I, I, I want to tilt us away from that world. Um, because again, this is the world of cheap food, cheap work, cheap labor, cheap care. Um, and I, I want to think as, and in fact, I want to follow an agroecological example to see what might be different. How do we, how do, we do things differently? Um, how is it that Frank and Majuma get to say something? How is it that they, their opinions matter? Well, this was a problem that was uh, faced by a group of uh, people, in particular um, uh, a, a nurse uh, in a pediatric nutrition clinic in northern Malawi. Uh, the nurse, uh, Esther Lupafia, is a fantastic organizer and was very concerned uh, with the, uh, the, the, the struggles of, um, the, uh, of the, the, that she was seeing. I mean, in, in Malawi at the time, uh, the life expectancy was, I believe, 46 years and falling. Uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic, the prevalence of, uh, of AIDS was 15%. Uh, the uh, income was 50 cents a day. This was in 1999, 2000. People were incredibly poor. Uh, and were struggling, and she, she was seeing rates of stunting um, of, of children denied food so systemically that their bodies had been sort of broken. Uh, those rates, those stunting rates, were around 50% uh, in Malawi. So she, she, you know, she understood that there was, a, there was a deep problem here, and the way she went about uh, transforming it was with uh, the organize, with, with uh, luckily that there was a, a graduate student, uh, Rachel Besner Kerr, um, who does fantastic work with the Soils, Food, and Healthy Community Project. Uh, and th they set up the Soils, Foods, and Healthy Community Project. And, and what they did was um, say, okay, well, let's, let's, start, let's start farming. Let's, let's start growing things other than the staple crop in Malawi, which is corn, right? So in, in addition to corn, we need a range of other crops. And so uh, they, you know, uh, 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 the agricultural extension services weren't helpful. 
Um, as Raphael, I think, mentioned earlier on, structural adjustment had really crippled the ability of Malawian extension services to be able to provide any you know, uh, genuine agricultural help. And insofar as they did provide help, it was just use this fertilizer. Uh, maybe you want to grow tobacco. That would be great because we need, we need the foreign exchange. You know, the, the extension services were really denatured. And so th instead, they started what they called sort of farmer research groups. Uh, and initially, it was with 187 farmers, uh, and it grew in the first few years to, to 3,000 3, uh, and, uh, and then to 6,000. And these farmer research groups shared seeds that Rachel had been able to get. And, you know, they, they, they did the kind of agroecology that we, 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 we've, we've heard about uh, where, you know, you're intercropping, you're uh, helping to build soil fertility, you're helping to provide shade. Shade, a, a tremendously important part of managing climate change. Uh, you know, in uh, Malawi, the extreme heat damages crops, and apparently shade cover can increase yields by 15%. So they, you know, they're, they're growing leguminous trees, trees that fix nitrogen in the soil and provide shade cover. And as a result of all of this, they're able, you know, the, the farmers engage in these peer-to-peer -peer knowledge networks. The farm, you know, the campesino or campesino networks that you see in Central America, they, they were doing that. Uh, and in their farmer research groups, they were scientists. They were, they were their own extension agents. Uh, and th they were swapping ideas around, well, what works here? And what, you know, if you've got this kind of land, how, how do you make it work? What, you know, how did you do it? And th they, they swap ideas, and th they, th these ideas spread very fast. Um, you know, I, sometimes I, I, I described it as kind of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, but without electricity. Um, and that's a bad analogy, because w when you're peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, you're just clicking. Th th there's not much to it. Uh, the, the knowledge is just sort of transmitted electronically and you're done. Here, you had to organize. You had to be together. You had to learn how to become scientists. And those skills uh, w w were tremendously important. Uh, and they, they helped uh, the, you know, to, to hone these agricultural uh, uh, sort of results so that um, they, they were able to, to have uh, as much corn as before and between 40 to 60% more protein. It was amazing as much corn as before, and way more protein. Uh, so, so then they came up with this, this other problem. Uh, and, and, and this is, you know, the, you, you have these, these fantastic fields. This is probably, this is an off-season. But, but you know, the, the, you have these uh, wonderful sort of, uh, uh, sort of diversified farming systems. But you have a problem, which is, yes, you've got more food from the fields, uh, but it's possible for infant malnutrition to increase. You've got more foods in the fields. But infant malnutrition goes up. Now, I know a few of you have heard this question asked on YouTube. So I'm going to ask those of you who haven't heard the answer to this, have a guess. How is it that infant malnutrition can go up even though you've got more stuff coming out of the ground? Working mothers? Damn. Usually it takes much longer to get to that answer. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so you, usually people say, well, you know, it's, uh, you know, they don't like the food. Uh, and, and then the answer to that is, well, I mean, actually, you know, th there's, there's this sort of myth about peasant conservatism uh, that, that, you know, peasants just don't like new stuff and they are stuck in their ways. But if you go to a, a, you know, a, 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 a Malawian garden, you'll find food from around the world and people are kind of digging it. Um, and other people say, well, no, maybe it's for export. And it's true that, that some, of the, some of these crops are export crops, but, but most of them are, are for domestic consumption. But the reason that infant malnutrition goes up is because harvesting is women's work. Harvesting is women's work, but so is cooking and cleaning and fetching firewood and uh, 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 carrying water and breastfeeding. So if you have more work to do, because we've heard uh, time and again that agroecological work is labor intensive, so you've got more labor, and you still need to cook and clean and fetch, carry water and fetch firewood, then breastfeeding can go down. How do you solve that problem? Shout it out, I can't do it. Have the baby with her. Um, th that, I mean, th some of this work is pretty backbreaking, uh, so you, you probably wouldn't want the baby there. Um, other ways in which we think big. How, how, how do you... Uh, Where are the men? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, so no, uh, it, it, it's super interesting. The, the, I mean, someone said, I think, get, get the men to work. The women want to control the harvest, because this is actually an income stream. 
To be able to control the harvest is actually to then to be able to make sure that, that you sell at the highest price and you're able to use the money for the family. Um, there have been occasions uh, where men have taken the, you know, the harvest and then sold it for less than it's worth and then drunk the, the harvest away. So you want to avoid that. So then how do you, I mean, specifically, how, how, do, you, how do you change that? Maternity leave is hard because there's no one to grant the leave and the, the, the state is bankrupt. So, uh, no, not, not maternity leave. How do you get... Sorry? Share breastfeeding with... With other... No, but the other mothers are out in the field. No, come on. Well, no one say, get the men to cook. Get the men to cook and clean and carry water. That's great. How do you do that? The Food Network is exactly what they tried. So um, the, the Food Network is very interesting. So uh, you, uh, people know the Food Network, right? So, so the, the, uh, the, they tried this Food Network approach. It was, um, it, it was awesome. They, 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 they initially, the, the, and this idea emerged from the, the farmer research groups themselves, right? Uh, and they said, well, obviously what we need to do is get, get the men to cook and, you know, so we'll go around door to door yeah, one-to-one -one education, really intense educational experience. And we'll go, and we'll go with a, you know, so, someone who knows nutrition and someone who knows cooking, and we'll go visit a house. They go to the house, and they're like, man of the house, come out here. Uh, you, 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 you may have seen your wife hunched over this. Uh, this is a pot. Um, and and uh, uh, the man, oh, yeah, I've, I've seen that. I've, I've, I've often wondered how it works. Uh, and, and, uh, and so you know, and there's a sort of lovely... You know, there's a cooking thing, and it's, oh, it smells so good. How do you do that? And, you know, people are rubbing spices with their hands, and it's all, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's a delightful meal, and everyone's very happy, and the man's like, thanks very much indeed. Well, that's great. Thank you. I'm, 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 I'm transformed. Uh, and they, uh, you know, the, the, the folk leave, and nothing changes. Because, you know, I mean, like the Food Network, it's, it's entertainment. That was a, a fun educational experience that doesn't necessarily make that connection to anyone's real life. So they came up with something else. Uh, and this was, again, an iterative process. The, 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 rest of, you know, the, the Food Network thing was an experiment. They, you know, th these were scientists engaging in a social scientific experiment to see whether this made a difference. It didn't. So they tried something else. And the, science, the scientific experiment they tried, tried was something called recipe days. Now, in recipe days, you have uh, 100 people, uh, families, getting together and cooking together. Uh, and it's, I mean, it, it's, a, it's an, an exciting, it's a joyful occasion. Uh, where you know men teach one another to you know, not be afraid to pound soybeans and make soy milk. Uh, it becomes a space where people get to experiment with new recipes. You know, it, it's a competition, but it also becomes a, a space of equality. It becomes a space where uh, women and men get to teach one another, and that means it becomes a space where women get to call men out on our patriarchy. It becomes a space where all of a sudden those difficult conversations around injustice, particularly around patriarchy, but also conversations between mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law uh, around bad feeding practices. All of a sudden, that becomes possible to say. It becomes a space where, uh, like a prefigurative community, it's, it's a sort of idea about the world to come, and you're experimenting, and you're living with it now. And that, together with hard feminist organizing afterwards, has resulted in some fairly substantial transformations. Now, it, it, it's, it's hard to imagine that. Um, so what I'd like to do is show it to you. Uh, and this is uh, a, a, a project that I'm working on at the moment with uh, the director, Steve James. Steve James is uh, perhaps best known for his documentary film, Hoop Dreams, um, and more recently, The Interrupters. Uh, but I, I was privileged to work with him uh, in this, this project called Generation Food. And uh, I just want to show you a clip of what recipe days look like and what the, the organizing afterwards looks like. And then, then I'll, I'll sort of close up. Um, that ends on a downer. Um, and that's the way, I mean, it, when you, I mean, I, I think it's, it's fair to represent that struggle in the way that, that, that we have at that time. I mean, I, I love this, this Orson Welles quote, of course, if you want a happy ending, it depends, of course, on where you want to end your story. Um, because, I mean, as every organizer knows, you go through the downs and the ups. The downs are just, you know, if it was easy, they wouldn't call it struggle, right? Uh, so the, the, this, I mean, the, the, there is, in fact, a happy ending here, um, but not in the way that you think. Uh, Winston is recalcitrant. He is not, uh, unlike other men in that village, um, he has not uh, d discovered that he is able to, to participate in the household in the way that, that 
he, he uh, the, 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 certainly the, the, the Jennifer wants him to. But luckily, this isn't about wives' empowerment, this is about women's empowerment. Uh, and there's a difference. And for, uh, for, for Jennifer, uh, she has, through Anita's mentoring, been able not only to be able to grow this agro, uh, agroecological uh, uh, farm herself, but then able to be helping other women who have it much, much tougher than her. Uh, and she has become a leader in, in the community. And you, th 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 this has actually massive kind of repercussions for the for the story of these villages, but also for the, the ideas of getting to the right to food. So as, as, we, as we come into the home stretch here, I just want to show you, I mean, the, the happy ending, uh, you, you need to be able to telescope out. Um, because as a result of organizing together, as a result of doing these farmer research groups, uh, people have discovered that they are more powerful than they think. As a result of doing agroecology, Agroecology, I mean, Claire put it so, so well earlier on. I mean, it's, it's a practice and a movement and a science, and doing it makes you powerful. And they've been able to demand better sanitation and healthcare as a result. Uh, they've been able to develop their own grain storage, so they're being able to sort of smooth out seasonal fluctuations in prices. They've developed their own credit facilities and be able to you know, set up uh, access to loans for themselves, uh, which were going very well until the World Bank, sorry, the IMF devalued the currency, but th th that's also on the rebound. Um, they, you know, they've, uh, their agriculture is climate change ready, and they've also developed this uh, climate change enterprise. What, what some of the stoves that you saw them cooking over there uh, are stoves designed to use much less firewood than uh, you know, op open fire cooking. And they, they, they call them climate change stoves because the wood is that much harder to get and they know why. Um, and perhaps the, the, the biggest victory of all is in these areas, the, mal the, the pediatric nutrition clinic has closed because there aren't any cases. So in a country where 50% of the children still remain stunted, the villages that have been involved in this process, uh, through the recipe days, but through the organizing and through the demanding of change, they've been able to be so successful that there aren't enough cases of malnutrition to justify a child malnutrition clinic. And all of that's been done for $8 per person per year. Now, that's, I mean, th th this is peanuts, obviously. Uh, and uh, in part, of course, I, I put that figure up there as a provocation, having talked about a bad investment. Um, the, the, but but the, money, the, the money isn't the issue. Unthink that thought about, my God, that's cheap, and look, th think, of, think of what they've done. But think instead about that process of agroecology, right? The, the, the process whereby you are able to build a community and then fight for change. That's, that, it seems to me, is the, the important part of the story. Um, and if you think, well, all right, that, that, that just works for this particular village, um, but you know, this is this is just a this is a piddly story and it doesn't really have much uh, uh, significance beyond these women. You know, we love them, but the, you know, this is not a not, not a big deal. Um, this is a very interesting uh, graph, looking at uh, looking at the reasons why ch uh, child stunting. Uh, has declined over the past 40 years, from 1970 to 2010. And this is in India. Uh, and uh, th I, I, I would urge you to look up this, this paper. Uh, uh, this is by uh, Lisa Smith and Lawrence Haddad. Um, but it, it, when you hear people say, if we don't grow enough crops, the children will starve, this is the graph to whack out. Um, because, first of all, it, this, is in, uh, it, this is actually in South Asia, but it's dominated by India. Um, uh, this is the epicenter of the Green Revolution. And you know, the Green Revolution came to India in the 1960s. You would think, over this period, if the Green Revolution was as awesome as everyone says it would be, then the, the, the effect of that would have been to, uh, to, be, you know, to, to have increased dietary energy supply, uh, and that would have been a, a, you know, a main driver for, end, you know, for ending child stunting. And you can see that increasing the, the energy supply uh, is, is responsible for 4.2% of the reduction of child uh, malnutrition over 40 years. It's nothing. So we need to unthink this logic of oh, more crops and happier people. It's, this, is, this is a graph that, that oh, this is a, an analysis that points out how wrong that thinking is. Because by contrast, uh, if you look at female secondary uh, school enrollment um, and the gender life expectancy ratio, which is a proxy for other kinds of women's empowerment, you can add them together and get 45% of that change. So if you're interested in undoing this global ecology, then actually looking at the cheap care as well as the cheap food, is a vital part of this story. If we're interested in, and, and I guess what's exciting about agroecology is it, it provides the kind of organizational experience and tools to be able to demand that change. 
And I'm, I'm coming to the end now, but you know, th these ideas of food sovereignty and agroecology are vital because in them, everyone is a scientist and an entrepreneur and an activist and a cook. You know, this isn't to say that, that entrepreneurism is, is a bad idea. Everyone's an entrepreneur. Uh, this isn't me saying hating on the private sector in general. This is just me hating on the way that the private sector uh, and food giants behave today. But entrepreneurism is fantastic. And everyone, you know, the, the, that's the thing that's, that's kind of being celebrated here. Um, the, the, this is also a, an example of contributive justice. I mean, we, we may be familiar with the idea of restorative justice. Uh, quick show of hands, are people familiar with the idea of restorative justice? Have you heard of restorative justice? Yeah, the idea, if you haven't heard of it, yeah, if, if a crime is committed, then the criminal will make, you know, make reparations to the, uh, the family in order to return things to the status quo. You, know, to, you, you make reparations to your victim. But what if the status quo isn't good enough? What if the status quo sucks? Uh, contributive justice is the idea of making, not just moving to a, a status quo again, but actually building that better world. And of course, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, but it's also um, joyful, loving, and tough. You know, the, 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 one of the questions we've been dancing around, not dancing around, but we, we've been glancing over, is how do you make people with power give up that power, right? And th this example, I mean, what's interesting is that Winston is obdurate, but in general, uh, the, 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 the men in these villages are, giving, uh, are becoming less patriarchal. I mean, becoming less patriarchal is a lifelong project, not just for me, but for any man who gives a, you know, gives a damn about patriarchy and, and justice. And that's a lifelong project we have to unschool ourselves in. But it's possible, and it's possible both through you know, the, the, the joy of this recipe day um, and through love, but through tough organizing, and it's difficult. And uh, again, that's why to end on that downer, um, because it's not going to be easy, and it, it'd be wrong to misrepresent it as, as that. Uh, it, it's it's going to be hard, but it's possible. Uh, and I think through organizing and through being tough and through being uncompromising, we can reinvent this idea of the commons, which is what they were doing there in Malawi. And so to, just to end, I mean, I, I, I want to end on, on this kind of idea of, well, what's it going to take for us to realize the right to food? And I, I just love this quote from C.L.R. James that every cook can govern. We have to fight so that in order to get the right to food, we need to organize. And we organize through things like agroecology, we organize through reinventing the food system, and we organize together. Uh, because, that, I mean, we organize around these principles of ending the, 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 the world of cheap food, of cheap nature, of cheap care, of cheap fuel. And that's a very different world to the world we live in now. And it's okay. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be tough, and it's gonna be joyful, and it's gonna be loving, but in the end, we'll all get to govern. And of course, that's why I love this quote, is because CLR James was a revolutionary. Thanks very much. Um, I can tell by the slowness by which you're quieting down that uh, Raj has uh, prompted some uh, great conversations. So for the first um, question, um, for CEOs to give up economic power seems much harder than for um, the male to give up uh, patriarchal power. How will this happen? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. And, and th that's why I was trying to use this both as specific example but also as metaphor. Um, it has to be joyful because, uh, joyful for us because it's going to take a lot of work. I mean, th th that's why those three slides of the protests of uh, those pictures of the protests, the fight for 15, um, were important, right? Because that's organizing. And the, the process of organizing needs to be joyful, otherwise no one's going to do it. Uh, I mean, that's... But luckily, we're in the food movement. Uh, you know, we, 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 we get to do food stuff. I mean, uh, 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 Michael Pollan had... Uh, uh, we were having a lovely conversation about how it... Did. There's a certain kind of person who drifts to the food movement as opposed to, say, the climate movement. Um, and, uh, you know, the, and it, it takes a certain kind of constitution to be faced with the climate change facts day after day after day and be able to hold your line. Uh, whereas in the food movement, it's like, we got food! Uh, and, 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 and that's important because uh, if, you're, if you're interested in sustaining the kind of hard organizing uh, around, ident first you have, you have to identify the power, you have to come in with a politics. You can't just say, well, we'd like to give up power, please. I mean, you have to come with this alternative of equality. The, the idea is that we, we're demanding equality, we're demanding the right to govern, and that means you corporations have to give, you know, give up that power, and we're not going to let you hang on to it. And that means direct action. I mean, that's the other thing about this agroecology idea, right? It's about direct action. It's not about click, uh, or we've, you know, we've shared agroecological knowledge, click, we've grown something else. It's, this isn't clicktivism. It's direct action. That's what they were doing. 
Uh, and I think that, that the idea of direct action, together with a politics that is joyful and tough and loving, is important. I mean, the, I, I, sometimes I, I throw up this, the, the Che Guevara line about, uh, I, you know, the, the, I, I believe that, that actually to be a revolutionary is to, is to have a heart filled with love. I think it's, a, it's a line like that. Um, and sadly, um, when he was using that line, he was really, he, the, the, speech, well, the speech, the letter in which that appears is when he's talking about, he's talking about how wonderful Fidel Castro is and how Fidel is going to make some tough decisions for us all, but that's okay because his heart is filled with love. Um, and, and so I, I, that's not the kind of love that I, I'm interested in. The, the, the kind of love I'm interested in is, is the kind of love that comes with solidarity, um, of loving a stranger of loving, you know, of, of finding within ourselves a capacity to, for sympathy um, and emotional connection with people we don't know. And that love, together with the toughness, I mean, it's, you're not giving ground, you're getting involved, plus the joy that is a kind of rocket fuel to be able to keep this movement going. That's how we're going to do it. We're, gonna, we're going to take capitalism. Can I just have everyone in this room say the word capitalism? Good, because that, that's one of the things that, that's very hard to say. Uh, I mean, it, it's hard to say capitalism, right? I mean, it, it, it's it's it, 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 we've been told it's so damn good, uh, but if it's so damn good, why is it why does it still feel like a little like you've said a dirty word? <laughs> say it again, capitalism. <laughs> All right. Anyway. See, but, but you see, like it's it's I mean, but it's it's kind of like ooh, I, I, I've been a bit naughty. Um, uh, <laughs> But you haven't, you've identified a problem, is what you've done. Uh, and uh, in order to be able to move forward, you, you need to be able to just say, you call it what it is, and understand its ecology of cheapness. And understand that the world we're going to build after that values care, values uh, labor, values the environment. And we, we get to dream that world, uh, as Zapatista says, one foot at a time. But that's the world we know we're, we're walking towards. So tough, joyful, loving. Just like in uh, this Malawi example. And maybe this question um, uh, brings it right down to a single corporation. How do you confront Monsanto, which has no real existence in time and space? <laughs> wow. The, is marijuana legal here? I don't, I, I, don't, I, 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 I just, I mean, because... I mean, I, I, we confront Monsanto every day, of course, because because they have very they do have a real existence in time and space. I mean, I, I, obviously, I get I get where the question is going, which is around corporate personhood. Uh, it, it seems to me. I mean, the, 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 there's the specific, and then there's, there's, there's the general thing, right? I mean, in general, corporations are these uh, these these sort of uh, these ghosts that, that appear um, and persist uh, and you know have have these sort of ethereal connections. But they are very material ghosts. Uh, and the, the, way, the way to confront Monsanto is, uh, I mean, I learned from the MST, the Brazilian Landless Rural Workers Movement, uh, and they confront Monsanto on every level. You confront Monsanto by uh, not buying, their, you know, buying foods containing their products. You uh, encourage your, your friends and family to do the same, and you, you, know, you, you it, 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 for, for, this, for these purposes, keep your body as a, as a pure temple free of Monsanto. But then beyond that, because it's so hard to do, because Monsanto's products appear in all these, you know, in, in pretty much everything, um, it's hard then to, to be able to, to, to adhere to that idea of purity. And purity is a rubbish idea. Um, so you also have to get involved in local uh, initiatives, like I mean, in, in Maine, uh, there are, you know, there's, there's the possibility of politics to end corporate personhood. So that's that's what you do there. And I, and I think you know the, the labeling initiative is interesting. I think that it opens the door to other things, but. It, it's, it seems to me what's exciting about the labeling initiatives are the possibilities for organizing and change that emerge as a result. I mean, when uh, you know, progressive food system things crash and burn, they often crash and burn because uh, communities of people of color and poor communities are outside the organizing in order to be able to fight you know, for labeling, for instance. If we're interested in building a food movement that does what we need it to do, that is revolutionary, then that means working with the concerns and uh, with the, the, the movements that already exist of people of color and poor people in the United States and beyond. So I think organizing against Monsanto is, you know, I think the labeling initiatives are interesting as long as we get there inclusively. I mean, if it, if it just becomes a kind of white middle class thing, then, then obviously it's going to fail and it's not going to get us very far in, in confronting Monsanto. So, you know, you, you do that in, in Brazil, they burn the fields occasionally. Uh, if you're going to, I mean, again, direct action, that's important. Uh, but but I, I mean, I, I think that it, it's a range of things. And it's also, I mean, it's also the ideological grip that Monsanto has. Um, I think we, there was a Bico line that, that, that came up yesterday about uh, the most powerful 
weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And so many people still believe that what we need is Monsanto to, to help us grow more food. And that's why I threw up that, you know, that pie chart at the end uh, about, look, if you're interested, if you care about kids, and who doesn't care about kids, hands up if you, don't, if you care about kids. You know, it, 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 if, if you care about that, then here's the evidence, here's the data. Talk to people. I mean, this is a cultural transformation to make Monsanto irrelevant. And to be able to point out that you know, the, the, one of the major arguments against genetically modified crops is that we don't need them. And we don't need Monsanto. Monsanto needs us. And the minute we actually recognize that and uh, the minute we recognize how redundant they are, uh, we, we start winning a, a very powerful battle. Thank you, Varaj. And for the, for the last question, you talked about unpacking terminology. So could you talk about the commons? What do you take to be the essential attributes of a rebuilt commons? Oh, that's a, what a fantastic question to end on. Okay, so um, when I first came to the, the state, I mean, my, my first interaction with the commons, of course, is the, the British House of Commons. Uh, you, you may have you know, heard it or seen it, you know, men going, rah, 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 rah. Um, and, then, and then when I came to America, it was very exciting because I was told that, that, uh, that there was a pilgrimage that I had to make from, from New York to New Jersey so that I could go to Woodbury Common, uh, which is an outlet mall. I mean, it was very exciting. We, 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 we didn't have those in Britain, so it was... It was but, but, but the idea, I mean, we, we come to understand the commons uh, today really as just land, right? You know, the, the, um, you know, just sort of green space. That's not really the commons. Um, the commons is a set of principles that are about equality and about government, uh, governance and mutual aid. Um, it's an, it, uh, for me, the idea of the commons is, is a very deeply anarchist idea. Uh, anarchist in, in absolutely the, the best sense of the term, not, not anarchy like chaos, which is the, the synonym that often plays on television, but anarchy like every cook can govern. Right? So the, the, the idea of, of the, the commons is about us learning and building the rules together so that we do decide how to stint, for example. If we, you know, if we don't have markets to put prices on things, how do we know how much they're worth? How do we value things? Well, in order for us to value things, we have to, we have, to have a conversation about them. Right? And, and the, art of, uh, the art of commoning is really an art about learning to value things differently. I mean, if we're moving away from cheap stuff, we're moving, to, we're moving to value, we need to value some other way. The market doesn't give us good valuations. Uh, and commoning is the art of learning to value together. Thank you, Raj.